So recently I've acquired some Power Mac and Mac Pro machines for very cheap. Uh, they were saved by my buddy who recycles old electronics and when he gets vintage Apple gear he usually calls me up and I buy it off him. And I've already featured one of the machines from this lot, the Mac Pro. Uh, we took a look at that guy in a previous episode and it had some quirks to work out like a dead GPU and a screwed up optical drive assembly. But other than that, it ended up working just fine. So over the weeks, I've been slowly chipping away at these guys from the same lot, testing them out, seeing if they need any fixing. And the next item on my list was this Quicksilver Power Mac G4. At this point, I have all generations of G4 Power Macs. I did a video on the MDD model last year, and I also have the Graphite model, and they're all pretty awesome in my opinion. They represent a time when Apple managed to combine not only the aesthetics, but also the functionality, which was one of the key features for this fellow. It was designed to be very easy to open up and work on, and contrary to popular belief, uh, Apple actually used a lot of industry established standards. I mean, we have a standard looking ATX power supply, and these are just standard Molex connectors for delivering power to the I.O. components. We have standard PC133 SD RAM sticks alongside IDE connectors for both the hard drive and the optical drives. This configuration actually has a zip drive instead of the second optical drive, so that's cool, don't see that too often, but Apple was into zip drives back in the day. So yeah, all pretty modular, easy to access and replace if need be. So usually I really like working on these guys and I have actually showed myself replacing the thermal paste on it a couple of videos back since I was talking about replaceable CPUs. And yeah, this one is on a little daughter card with a custom connector at the bottom. The heatsink is held on with two clips and it took me a while to figure out how to get it off and put it back on and I've actually removed a couple of memory sticks and the graphics card to get to it, but it wasn't hard. So after making that video, I've set the machine aside until I had the time to get back to it. And once the time came, I wanted to make it a bit more presentable, so I've started cleaning it up. It was actually quite clean, but it did have some nasty gouges on the plastic side panel, but nothing too horrible. I made sure to get in all the nooks and crannies and also to dust off the insides. I've taken out the battery, not just because it was very dead, but these things can leak, so it's best to take them out even if you don't plan on replacing them straight away. I've also taken my time to clean out around all the vents and drives. And I've also noticed how this thing was not only missing the hard drive, but also the little caddy the drive mounts to. But that's not a huge deal, you can still just hook one up without the tray for testing purposes. After it was all nice and cleaned, I've set it all up, hooked up the power and the monitor, and I've tried turning the machine on. I didn't hear a sound, nothing, nada, which is strange and indicates that something must be wrong with the power delivery. It also meant I was going to have to do some troubleshooting if I was to see this thing boot. Now when dealing with a computer that doesn't respond at all, the failure point is going to be A, the switch, which is actually quite common on these since there's a little controller board. It's not a simple hard on off switch, there's a controller which fails sometimes, so that could certainly be what's wrong with this. B, the power supply, which again, those are wear components, they do fail, especially after decades of use. And there are many components on those that can fail, from capacitors to fuses. But before going too deep and taking things apart, I wanted to rule out some easily removable components. I took out all the RAM sticks as well as the video card in case either the component itself or the slot was faulty and it was preventing the thing from powering on, even though that's not very likely in this case since the computer wasn't even trying to turn on. And yeah, that didn't improve the situation in any way, so I've proceeded to remove the little switchboard assembly which is underneath this metal shield and it's connected to the main board with a ribbon cable. So I wanted to roll out the cable and testing out the continuity, I could see that there weren't any breaks in it. 
but while probing around with a multimeter I became concerned as I saw no activity on any of the rails or pins which could indicate that there was indeed something wrong with the power supply. It was time to take it out and to take a closer look at it. And before going any further, do not do this at home. Don't open up power supplies if you don't know what you're doing. This is not like working on game consoles with an external power supplies. I mean, if you get zapped while doing that, you're gonna feel it, but it's probably not gonna hurt you. We're talking like 5 to 12 volts and very low current. This guy, however, deals with very high AC and DC voltage. You have 120 or 240 volts coming in and that can flat out kill you. So if you have a bad power supply, just replace it with another one. It's not worth risking your life over it. The only reason I'm doing it is because the pinout on this power supply is slightly different than most. For example, it has a ground pin where most ATX power supplies have plus 5 volts and also it's not completely pin compatible in other ways. And yes, you can indeed convert another more regular ATX power supply to work with these, but I wanted to investigate this one first. I also do have working power max with compatible power supplies, but they're stored away at my other place. And final point, I was just curious, and that's the hardest thing to fight off for me. I just wanted to know what was wrong with this thing, so I've decided to take you all for a ride. I thought I could perhaps take it out without removing the optical drive assembly first, but unfortunately no, it had to come out, but it was held in place with just a couple of screws, so no big deal, after which the power supply popped right out. Before taking it out completely, I just wanted to take a peek inside, the idea being perhaps there's just a blown fuse which I could easily replace or bridge and that'd be it. So I took the cover off the power supply and started looking around for blown fuses. The first place I looked was around where the input voltage would be introduced since that's the spot where they usually put fuses in, so if there's a lightning strike or a surge it protects the circuit at the very beginning. And initially I wasn't finding any fuses because I was looking for socketed ones, but then I figured it must be under that bit of heat shrink tubing, and yeah it sure was. Now a word on this power supply in general, I mean it was very densely packed and looked to be of high quality and the reason I say that is because there are some subtle cues. For example those zip ties keeping all the wiring nice and tidy, all the white silicone goo that was placed around many of the components to keep them from shorting out and to keep them from breaking off. There were also nice big aluminum heat sinks to which many of the components were mounted to. But all that also meant this was a pain in the ass to work on and troubleshoot since it made it very difficult to for example remove parts of it without disassembling and desoldering or cutting many of the wires. So I had to work around all that and I've proceeded to uncover the fuse which was indeed buried underneath that protective tubing like many of the other components. And testing it out I could indeed see that it was blown, which is always a double-edged sword. While it can mean that it's just an easy fix, since hey, pop in the new one and Bob's your uncle. It can also mean that something else is wrong with the circuit, since some other component going bad could indeed cause the fuse to blow. But I've looked around and at this point I couldn't tell anything had blown in there. So the second stupid thing I did on purpose, since I didn't have a replacement fuse handy and it wasn't in the socket, was to just bridge the connection without the fuse in place, which you should never do, it's extremely dangerous because in case there's still a short somewhere, you could cause a fire. I have soldered a piece of wire in place of that fuse, which was a total pain in the butt given how little space was left for my soldering iron to fit. I had to fit it between all those wires and components and yep, I've managed to burn myself on the iron in the process. Awesome. <laughs> But I've managed to do it and after checking that it wasn't shorting anything out, it was time to test it out. I've plugged the thing in and I had it connected to a switch operated extension cord so that I could turn it off and on from a safe distance. And it was a good thing I did since when I flicked the switch, this happened. Yeah, this was a classic electro boom moment, which I mean we all need a little excitement in our lives, am I right? Let's see that again. So 
So something, some component evidently blew up and caught on fire, which is why I've told you never to do this. Imagine this happened while the power supply was closed up and installed in the case. You might have missed what happened and left the power on, which could very easily lead to a fire or your house wiring melting or something else. Thankfully I was there to cut the power immediately so that we can assess the damage. Inspecting the board I could see what happened. There was a blown component with a lot of black burn marks around it. I have proceeded to pull it out and it was wrapped in the same tubing like many of the other components. So after unwrapping it I could see that it was an MOV, a metal oxide barrister. And these components are usually installed with the purpose of protecting the circuit from over voltage spikes and surges. Now something that I haven't noticed until this point is that if you take a look at the power supply cover you can actually see a black scorch mark right where the component was installed. So that told me what likely happened. Uh, this thing blew because of some sort of a power surge alongside that fuse and with the fuse overridden it just completely disintegrated. But in my defense before I wasn't really able to see that the component had blown since it was encased in that heat shrink tubing. So what now? I mean I had to see whether replacing that MOV would get this power supply going again because if it did I'd install a new fuse in there and perhaps continue using it since I'm not really fond of throwing out components because of a couple of cents worth of faulty parts. So the next morning I went to my local electronics store to get some fresh components. As you can see I've removed the power supply entirely just so that it'd be easier to work on. Looking up the numbers on that busted MOV I was pretty sure I've gotten the correct value but just in case I didn't and because they were cheap I just got a couple of more slightly different values. And I went to town soldering this guy in which was extremely frustrating because again I had pretty much no space to work with. Okay, as you can see I have given myself a bit more space by removing this fan uh, out of here because I figured I could just unscrew it from this side. And after that I was finally able to get in there with my soldering iron and I was able to solder both of the legs of the MOV uh, to the board. And I purposely left the legs of the components too long because it would just make it easier to solder. So unfortunately we're at the point where we have to test this thing and I don't mind telling you that I'm more than a bit skeptical about it after the last fiasco we had with this thing almost burning my house down. But I mean we have to try, right? I mean I'm too curious now and I have taken some safety measures. I have this thing plugged into the extension cord here and I'm going to be monitoring what's happening and if I see or hear anything funny I'm just gonna cut the power to it. And if I do end up burning down my house, at least it's going to be on video, am I right? I've turned the power on. Oh god, my spider senses are tingling hard. So the thing is supposed to be on. Nothing exploding as of yet. So what I'll do next is I'll test whether or not it's actually outputting any power. So I'll test the voltages. So yeah, there were no sparks, no fire, which was reassuring. One annoying thing about this power supply is it doesn't have a traditional power switch on it. So in lieu of that, I've shorted the power on pin to ground using a paper clip to get it to turn on. And upon flipping the switch on my extension cord, yeah, nothing happened. I have tested all the other pins of the connector, but there was just no activity whatsoever. I have then proceeded to try poking around this thing with a multimeter trying to trace the voltage down to another bad component which was pretty much impossible with the thing not being fully disassembled but I just figured I needed to replace that blown varistor and I'd be in business but unfortunately that wasn't the case. I have also tried a couple of those other MOVs since I had them on hand but no. And I have also tried connecting it to the main board and the switch just in case it absolutely needed to be turned on in that manner but as expected no result and the fact that the power button didn't even light up just confirmed that there was no juice flowing from that PSU. And I'm pretty sure people will say it's because I haven't replaced the battery on the motherboard or something stupid but just to be sure I've tried that too. Now I don't really think this video had a particular message apart from don't try fixing power supplies especially if you don't know what you're doing but if there is one thing I can teach you if you're into tinkering with all the electronics is you have to know when to quit.
going into every project, if you're half as stubborn as I am, we all want to see the damn thing work again, even if it means wasting hours poking the thing with a flat head with no results. And like here, I'm sure if I was to replace all the capacitors, there were some big old guys that could probably use replacing, and if I was to find a couple more blown components on that board, the thing might have ended up working. But given how dangerous working on power supplies is, there's a very high chance something would go wrong and I'd still end up with a broken PSU, possibly in the hospital by the end. And the best case scenario, I fix this up, it all works perfectly and... I have another power Mac, <laughs> alongside five more that are already working. And even if I quote unquote fixed the PSU, I wouldn't trust my work to leave this thing on for hours on end and I'd just be sweating the whole time waiting for this thing to go up in smoke and probably take the motherboard along with it. Besides, we'll test this guy out with a known working PSU one of these days and there's a high chance all the other components are working properly. And hopefully we don't burn our house down in the process. And I know this might have been disappointing for some of you, seeing how I haven't really fixed anything in this video, but hopefully you still had fun watching sparks fly all over and anticipating me killing myself in the process. And if you for some reason like watching me doing half-assed repairs, there are plenty of those here in my channel, some that went a bit better than this one. So you might want to check out some of my other videos, or you might even want to consider subscribing. I do these videos every week, and if you'd like to support what I do, you can do so on Patreon for just one buck a month, or more if you'd like. If you'd like to chat with me and other users, you can join our Discord server. All the links will be in the video description. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.